John 17. Okay. <laughs> I said I'd go through a bit of this and I will. I'll go through at least the opening verses today. So hello everyone. I hope you're all well. John 17 is the prayer of Jesus. These words spake Jesus and lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. So Jesus' prayer to the Father, it's the whole chapter. The whole chapter is Jesus' prayer, as you can see in the red letters there. That's the whole thing. The whole prayer is in John 17. It's the whole chapter. Okay, so these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. So, worth noting here, that Jesus is identifying the Father as the Father and himself as the Father's Son, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now, this is kind of interesting because, just look at these pronouns. Jesus referring to himself in the third person. And it might seem a little bit odd that Jesus is doing that. He's referring to himself in the third person. He identifies himself, Father, thy Son, the Son of the Father who is speaking to, and in these opening verses speaking in the third person. Okay, why is he doing that? Well, to understand this, it's worth remembering that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Okay, so throughout John and, and other scripture, you'll see Jesus refer to himself in the third person, sometimes as the Son of God, sometimes as the Son of Man. And what's going on in John 17 is within Christ's communication with the Father, he's making a point where he cuts something off. So if we go Let's just skip verse 3 for a moment and go to verse 4. You'll see Jesus says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So there's something going on here where Jesus is claiming the end of one thing and about to go into something completely different. Because this is really very soon before Jesus goes to the cross. And this prayer is right before Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and is betrayed by Judas and then is arrested and beaten and put on trial the following day and then goes to the cross as the lamb slain to shed his blood. Okay, so there's something going on here because what you'll notice is he switched to the first person right here. Let's just put that in a different colour. Okay, I have glorified thee 
I have finished. So let me just make that a bit clearer. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So in the first three verses, Jesus is speaking in the third person, thy son, him, he, him. Even in verse 3, refers to himself, names himself, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the first three verses, Jesus refers to himself in the third person. Let's read these three verses again. So verses 1 through 3. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Verses 1 through 3, Jesus speaking in the third person, speaking of the work which the Father gave him to do. Then from verse 4, he, he switches into first person mode. Okay, you'll see there as we go through the scriptures that he's, he's speaking in the first person from John 17 verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. So this is past tense now. It's done. This is done. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So from here on in, it's all on Christ. And this is why we preach faith alone in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Okay, because it's only the Son that goes to the cross, that sheds his blood, is buried and rises again the third day. That's all on Christ. Everything from here and out is on Jesus Christ alone. And why is it important that God devised this plan, which was devised before the creation of the world? Why is it important that he's made it like this? That he sends the Son, and it's the Son alone who is propitiation for our sins, and that we're justified or made righteous through his imputed righteousness upon us, that it's his blood alone that is shed. Why has God made it this way? It's because there's no confusion, there's no other God that has done this in this way, in this manner. You see, it's not enough to say, I believe the universe was created by a higher power, by a God. It has to be the right God. The God that gave his only begotten Son for the salvation of man. No other God has the power to save. No other God gave his Son, sent his Son to become flesh, to suffer everything that we know, to know everything that we know from our perspective. Now obviously God knows everything that we know, 
but to actually experience life in the flesh from our perspective. No other God has done that. And to go and die, to die, be buried and rise again, no other God has done that. And when I say no other God, I mean the gods that people believe exist. Obviously, there is only one God. There is only one creator of heaven and earth. But it's not enough just to sense that there's a higher power. Even to believe there's a creator without accepting the Son, the Son who died for our sin. Salvation only comes through accepting that God gave his Son for us. Verse 5 reads, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Again, he's addressing the Father. Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The glory which I had with thee before the world was. So, Jesus identifies himself to the Father as the Son. Why does he do that? Does he need to do that? I mean, after all, when we pray to the Father, we don't need to identify ourselves by name, which is what Jesus does here. He identifies himself by name. And by the way, don't believe anyone who tells you these are not Jesus' actual words, that Jesus would never have said, Jesus Christ, whom now is sent, that these are insertions or just understandings by the Gospel writers. The, this is the Word of God. This is what Jesus said. He said his name. Well, do we need to do that when we pray to the Father? No, we don't. We don't pray saying, Father in heaven, it is I, Ted, Sarah, John, whoever. We don't need to do that. The Father knows who's speaking to him. But here, Jesus is making absolute clarity, not of who he is, because God knows it's the Son speaking to him, but in which role he has come. Jesus is not identifying himself as the Word or the Lord or by any other title which he uses or is used of him or by anything else by which his name was called. He's being very specific here to call himself the Son, Jesus Christ. So why, why is this so? Why isn't Jesus identifying himself, for example, as the Word, the Word of God, or the Lord? Well, it's because when he's identifying himself as the Son, that's his, the Son, Father is a relationship. The Father-Son is a relationship. The Word, Jesus has always been the Word, and he's always been the Son, but the Word is a different thing. Let me show you quickly. Um, we can look at scripture that talks about the word which Jesus spoke, for example, and we can see certain characteristics in the word. 
So, for example, if we look at some of the New Testament scriptures that talk about Jesus actually speaking, we see that his, his word has very specific characteristics. Matthew 8.8 8 says, The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should comest under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. So speak the word, the word of the Lord, the word of God, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. So the word has the power to heal. The word of the Lord, the word of Jesus Christ, has the power to heal. Matthew 8.16 when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. So, again, the word has the power to cast out devils, and again, heal, heal all that were sick. In Matthew 26, verse 75, Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. So here the word is the power of prophecy. Luke chapter 3, verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So the word, another characteristic of the word, is that the word can seek out and find individuals. When God sends forth his word, it can individually seek out and find individuals for certain purposes. Luke chapter 4 verse 32 And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. There's power in the word. These are all characteristics of the word of God. And again, Luke chapter 4 verse 36 and they were all amazed and spake, spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this, for with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. The word has authority and power. Luke 11, verse 28, But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. You know the keep means to guard, protect, preserve. Okay, blessed are they that hear the word of God. So the word comes with blessings for those that receive it. There in John chapter 1, of course, the word, capitalized W, meaning Jesus, in the beginning was the word, so the word is eternal. And the word was with God, and the word was God. That's Jesus. But it's foolish to try and separate Jesus' spoken or written word, the scriptures, from him himself, because the word was made flesh. That's Jesus, of course, and as well as among us. John 2, 22. This demonstrates exactly what I'm saying here. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. One and the same thing, guys. John 4.41 
John 4, 41, and many more believed because of his own word, because of his own word, because of Jesus' word, many more believed. So the word has the power to make people believe, believe the word, believe Christ, one and the same thing. Again, you'll see this all through the scriptures. John 4.50 Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. So he believed the word. The word has the power to make people believe. The power to make believers. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Okay, so what can we take away from this? The characteristics of the word, which can be Jesus' spoken word, it can be the written word, or the word of God, Jesus himself. They all have the same characteristics. The word has the power to heal, to cast out devils, to make believers. The word has power and authority. So when Jesus is praying to the Father, he's not speaking with power and authority. He's not speaking with the power to heal, the power to cast out devils, the power to make believers. That would be inappropriate. He's speaking in relationship to the Father. He's speaking as the Son, identifying himself as the Son. The Word of God and the Son of God are one and the same, Jesus Christ, eternal. Those that say that Jesus Christ cannot be both the Word and the Son at any time, in any place, throughout all eternity, are missing the mark. They're missing the mark. They're lacking in understanding. They're missing the mark in their teaching. The Word and the Son, one and the same, eternally, Jesus Christ. But Jesus speaks as the Son to the Father. In the same way that in a different context he speaks the word to heal, to cast out devils and to make believers. The word and the son are one. They're never separate from each other. The word didn't become the son. The son then doesn't go on to become the word. The incarnational sonship Doctrine is false doctrine. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Jesus Christ is the eternal Word of God. You can't be eternal if you had a beginning or an end. Jesus has no beginning and no end. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the first. He is the last. A beginning or an end wasn't bestowed upon him. A beginning, an end isn't in his possession. It's what he is. God eternal. Those that claim that Jesus or the Word became the Son have a false Christ and therefore a false God. So when Jesus says, O now and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, before the world was, He's speaking as the Son, as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ 
the Son had glory with the Father before the world was. The name Jesus Christ, for the name of God, is eternal. It's an eternal name. It's not a name. It wasn't a new name or a new, he didn't have a new name when Mary gave birth or when she conceived. Matthew chapter 1, let's go there quickly. So Matthew 1 verse 21, talking regarding Mary, Jesus' mother, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now look, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. So his name is called Jesus. Again, in verse 25, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. He called his name Jesus. If you look at verses 22 and 23, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. See, his name, look, singular. His name, his name. He's only got one name. His name. He's only got one name, but his name shall be called. He called his name Jesus. His name they shall call his name Emmanuel. Thou shall call his name Jesus. It's one it's one name. It's called by, by many things. So his his name is holy. His name is eternal. God only has one name. And it's holy and it's eternal. But his name is called by many things. You, you'll never see scripture referring to his names, plural, ever. Even in Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. See, the son existed before before he appeared on earth um, in the time of Mary and Joseph. He's appeared on the earth before, of course, but not in the flesh. Uh, so the Son is eternal. eternal. He's the eternal Son of God, okay, just as he is the eternal Word of God. Uh, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name, see, singular, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This isn't saying that Jesus is the Father. This is a role he plays when he comes in the flesh, when he comes as the Messiah, as the Saviour, as the Master, as a uh, He's called Rabbi. He's called many things, okay? His name is called many things. Even in the New Testament, in his ministry, his name is called many things. He has many titles. The Everlasting Father is not calling Jesus God the Father. This is a position or a role he is in during his earthly ministry. He is acting on behalf of, of the Father to those whom the Father gave him. Okay, 
and look I can prove that he's only got one name it, it's really easy to prove this he only has one name his name is called look his name again this expression shall be called his name shall be called his name shall be called by many things if we go into the writings of Moses um, we go into Exodus chapter 3 so Moses um, this is Moses has an encounter with God so Exodus 3 13 Moses said unto God behold when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them the God of your fathers have sent me unto you and they shall say to me what is his name okay singular what shall I say unto them so Moses speaking to God and God sending him back into Egypt okay Moses fled Egypt he killed a man he feared for his life he fled and God is sending him back into Egypt to bring out the children the children of Israel so they shall say unto me what is his name what shall I say unto them and God said unto Moses I am that I am and he said thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel I am have sent me unto you thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel I am have sent me unto you so let's be clear Moses asks God when they ask me your name what shall I say unto them God says I am that I am I shall say unto the children of Israel I am have sent me unto you now look this is good this is very good and God said moreover unto Moses thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel the Lord God of your fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob have sent me unto you this is my name forever and this is my memorial unto all generations so thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel the Lord God of your fathers the Lord this is his name again the Lord the Lord God of your fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob so in Exodus 15 Moses speaking or Moses singing in fact and sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake saying I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphant gloriously the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea this is after the crossing through the Red Sea the Lord is my strength and song and he is become my salvation he is my God I will prepare him and habitation my father's God and I will exalt him the Lord is a man of war the Lord is his name the Lord is his name singular one name the Lord is his name so when God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 I am that I am thou shall say unto the children of Israel I am have sent me unto you and thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel the Lord God of your fathers 
have sent me unto you. This is my name for ever. His name is called by many things. One name. I am the Lord. One name, singular. One name, singular, called by many things. Jesus Christ. Okay. This name is eternal. This name is eternal. It's not a Hebrew name. Although it's used first by... It's given, the name was given to the Jewish people, but it's not a Hebrew name. It's, a, it's an eternal name. Just like I am that I am, the Lord, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Word of God. This is all his name, one name. Okay? So, I think I'll leave that there because it would be really interesting to go down through this whole chapter, but um, which I may well do. I'll probably go down through more of this chapter in future videos. I'm not sure when. I'll do it when the Lord prompts me. <laughs> um, but those first five verses there, that gives you, um, or it gives all of us a really good foundation to look at the whole prayer uh, from there on in and what you'll see is that you see Jesus has said I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do but he's then going to enter the garden of Gethsemane he's going to be betrayed of Judas like I said he's going to be arrested he's going to be beaten, put on trial, beaten again, sent to his death on the cross. So that's all on Christ. That's all on Jesus. Yes, it's the will of the Father that he does fulfill the plan of salvation, but it's all on Jesus. And this also explains something. This debunks the people that say, no, he wasn't always the Son. He came as the Son. He can't always be in the Son because the Son, the relationship between a Son and a Father is somehow submissive or subservient, or something like that. Clearly debunked here. Jesus himself debunks all these heresies, okay, because it isn't, it isn't anything subservient or submissive he goes to the cross as the Son of God, not subservient to the Father, not submissive to the Father. Yes, it's the Father's will, because he also makes more prayer after this prayer, saying to the Father, you know, not by my will, but by your will. So he... He... He does it by his own free will, but he's putting himself in the will of the Father. The will of the Father and the will of the Son cannot be different. Otherwise, he's not God. And we know he's God because he does the will of the Father. But he's finished the work that the Father gave him to do. And speaking of the Son, speaking as the Son, he says... He talks about the glory which he had with the Father before the world was. So this whole chapter actually debunks a whole ton of heresy, um, including the anti-Trinitarian people, those that deny the Trinity, those that deny the eternal sonship of God as well, or the eternal sonship of Christ, uh, and many other false doctrines out there this this prayer from Jesus to the Father from the Son to the Father is absolutely rich in um, 
good, wholesome Christian doctrine for those that can look at it uh, and see what and hear what the word is saying. But I'm going to leave that there. I would love to go more into this. But right now, I think this is probably enough for today. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.